Isaiah chapter 54, verse 14, it says, In righteousness you shall be established. By now you guys should know this stuff without even looking at your Bible. So, in righteousness you shall be established, you shall be far from oppression, for you shall not fear. And from terror, for it shall not come near you. Now, there's a reason why I really want to elaborate on this stuff. All right? As Christians, we often uh, get oppressed, true or false. Sickness, headache, I don't care how small it is or how big it is. Oppression is oppression. All right? So we're not supposed to be getting oppressed. And, and the reason we're not supposed to be getting oppressed is because Christ already died on the cross. Uh, to live in victory. To a door for the enemy to come in and oppress you. Now, remember 1 John chapter 5, right? Is it 5? Actually, 4. four. Yeah. Perfect love cast out all fear. So, in righteousness you shall be established, right? You shall be far from oppression, for you shall not fear. So, for you not to fear, you have to be established in righteousness, right? All right, to be established in righteousness is to walk in love. You guys remember this? Yeah. Walk in love. Remember? Yeah. Perfect love casts out all fear, right? Established in righteousness, you shall not fear. Perfect love casts out all fear, right? So to walk in love is to walk in the, the spirit. In the spirit. Good boy. Talk to yourself. That's three extra credit points for you. All right. All right, to walk in the spirit. So it's walk in love is to walk in the spirit. To walk in the spirit is to walk in the kingdom of God is righteousness, righteousness peace, and joy of the Holy Ghost. So uh, these three are, the, are, are one and the same. And what they do is they cast out all fear. When there is no fear, there cannot be any form of oppression. True or false? True. All right, good. So we want to eradicate this stuff in our lives, and we want to live in the victory in Christ Jesus. Okay? We want to live in victory in the victory in Christ Jesus. And, and we want this to become a, a part of our everyday life. Not oppressed today, victorious tomorrow. Victorious tomorrow, oppressed next week. Yes? Um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. And if it's not in line with what you're talking about, we can skip it. Okay. But, so, remember, I remember before we talked about how we embody righteousness just by believing in Christ, right? Right. Believing right. in Christ because we're born again. So then, I'm wondering, um, if all it takes to overcome oppression and to have victory is to be established in righteousness, because yeah. being established in righteousness is walking in love, and that is walking in the spirit. Right. So then, when it still happens... Right? When uh -huh. we are still oppressed, is it just that we need to come into the awareness? Is that the only piece? Because we know we are. We know we are oppressed, right? Okay, I see what you're saying. All right, so think about this. It says, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Mm -hmm. And now we agree that to walk in the spirit is to walk in love. Right. And to walk in love is to be, to come into this place where you're established in righteousness. Mm -hmm. All right, so you think about this, right? Now, as much as I, I say that these three are one and the same, mm -hmm. they are, but, but it's like this. This is a walk. Mm -hmm. This is an establishment. This is something that is done. Mm -hmm. All right, stay with me, guys. So, if, 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 for instance, the, the view, this building that we're in right now, it has a foundation. All right? And this structure is established on this foundation. Are you going to change the foundation? Is the foundation still being built? No, right? Are you guys with me? Yeah. But you're in the building, and the building has a foundation that is already established. So it's like this. When you say established in righteousness, you're saying that righteousness has become the foundation for your walk. 
Are you guys ready? So righteousness is the foundation for your walk. What walk? The walk of the spirit. The walk of love. My my walk, you know, me being able to function as a spirit being, are you with me? Or being able to function in love is dependent on my foundation. And my foundation has to be righteousness. And not just righteousness, but the righteousness in Christ Jesus. It is living from an awareness of who I am in Christ. Yeah? And this this awareness is fueling my walk. You guys are with me, right? Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. No. So, yes. go ahead, go ahead. That's cool. <laughs> no, we can keep going. Right. I need to think about it, yeah. All right. So, what is happening here is I'm walking in the Spirit. Now, even though I use this as a foundation, you know, I use the illustration of a foundation, uh, you know, we must understand that when it says, in righteousness you shall be established, I believe that what, what, what the Bible is saying is this. That in this thing called righteousness is our foundation. This is from where everything should flow out of. Yeah. In righteousness you shall be established. So you shall be established. You shall be established in righteousness. Alright? So it's like this. You are you you realize that your Christian walk is a day-to-day -day walk. Just like you think about crucifying your flesh how many times? A week. Yeah, daily, right? So these are, your, your walk of the Spirit is a day-to-day -day thing. You know, Jesus said, abide in my love. That is something we're supposed to be doing from day to day. Walk in the Spirit. It's a day-to-day -day event. Being filled with the Spirit is a day-to-day -day event. All right, so if if these things are, things are, are engagements that I'm supposed to, <laughs> are processes that I'm supposed to engage in every single day, then it means that they're supposed to flow from this pivot point. And the pivot point is righteousness. In righteousness, I shall be established. So from this place of righteousness, being my foundation, everything else begins to flow. Does that help? Mm -hmm. Okay. Meditate on this some more. And, you know, I believe the more we meditate on these things, the more revelation comes out of it. So, all right, all right, all right. so this is where we're at. Yeah. No, we want we want to get rid of oppression and fear and live in victory every day of our lives. Now, I, I'll give you some example, maybe one or two. Right? There was this one day. You know, a lot of Christians believe that demons can be. It's garbage. It's not true. It's rubbish. Ah, rubbish. shit. All right. Um. So one day, one day, I usually have these weird. Attacks or whatever, but I'm, I'm good in Jesus' name. <laughs> but one day I'm, I'm sleeping on my bed, right? And I'm laying down facing upward. Now, my head is at the. Top, leave me alone. <laughs> my, head, my head is at the tip of the bed. Okay? And there's this devil holding my head. Right? So it's holding my head like this. How did I know? I'll explain it a bit. But anyway, long story short, I have this dream, and this dream is real. Right? So I'm in this quote unquote, dream scene that was created by the devil that held onto my head. All right, so I'm in there. Well, I'm in there. I'm having this deep uh, interaction with this with two devils in the dream. But it wasn't a dream. It was a dream, but it wasn't a dream. It was when I say it wasn't a dream, I'm saying this was real. This wasn't just oh fantasy. All right, this was real stuff. So I'm in that dream. And I'm having this interaction. Long story short, I'm about to, don't sleep in my class. I will pull that on <laughs> So, in that dream, in that, in that dream, I'm, I'm transitioning from the dream state into real life. I'm waking up from my dream, okay? And while I'm waking up, I'm aware of the fact that my body's asleep. Remember, this is not me, right? I'm a spirit being, all right? So, I'm, I'm transitioning from that dream world into reality. Now, while my body still asleep, I open my eyes inside of my body, and I see this demon uh, holding my head. Okay? So I'm like, this is weird, yeah? So I start praying in tongues, and the demon starts to vibrate, and, drag, blah, 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 and eventually I push it off of me, and all of that kind of stuff. That, happens, that usually happens with you? 
Yeah. It happened. It happened. In your business over there. No, shut up. What? So, but it is. It's still me here. It's still me here. It's still me here. What is the moral of that story? <laughs> well, there's no moral, really. But what, what, this, what that experience helped me to do was to really understand one, one of the things that I knew before, and it's the fact that devils can read your thoughts. Wait, I don't know. How do they read your thoughts? They can read your thoughts. But they can read your thoughts. Now remember the video. Listen to me. Uh, you what guys have to go do some more research. Oh, yeah. Just stay with me. <laughs> <laughs> you can get to the point how they read your thoughts. Yeah, just stay with me. Okay. All right. So remember the video we watched. You guys remember that? Well, um, About vibrations yeah. and stuff like that. Remember <laughs> to what the end where he said that your thought is a vibration and it emits a frequency. Right. Yeah. So you think about that. You're thinking things, and it's going out. It's not staying here. You think you're thinking and it's staying in your head, but that's not true. What you're thinking is going out. It's it's just like you're farting from your head. What am I saying? Uh, no, I'm, I'm trying to give you a, a picture of what I'm talking about. It's like there's this thing coming out of your head. It's your, it's, your thoughts are, are leaving your body. Are you with me, guys? Yeah. Okay, so think about this. What am I seeing? I'm seeing you guys, and you are simply... Energy vibrating at a frequency, right? Mm -hmm. So that means that I've learned how to perceive this frequency called you, right? Yeah. yeah. You keep, you, you know, if you put some, if you put food in the microwave, would you be able to see the the frequencies coming out, the gamma rays and all of that, whatever kind of rays? You're not seeing it because you've not learned how to perceive that kind of frequency. Okay? So, if I can... Now, think about Jesus. Jesus knew people's thoughts. Right? How was he able to know that? He saw the frequency. He saw the frequency? He knew that he knew. He got it? Let me, let me ask you a question. There's this guy named Hosea in the Bible, right? No, sorry. Habakkuk. Habakkuk. Habakkuk, yeah. Habakkuk, Habakkuk, whatever. He, he says this in chapter 2. I will set myself on a rampant to see what he would say to me. On a, what? The, just chill. Listen, okay? What he says is this. I'm going to position myself in a place where I can see what God is going to say to me. Wait, what do you mean see what someone is going to say? He he was he wanted to see what God was gonna say. That's because he learned how to see words. It's all frequencies. Like how do you do that? Do you write? It's we're gonna talk about that next week. Next week we're talking about training your senses. All right. So you you think about uh, Elijah, right? The Bible says, you know, this guy just killed a whole bunch of uh, prophets of Baal, Baal or whatever the, the idol's name was. And after that, he started running, remember? And a message was sent to him from Jezebel before he ran, actually. Jezebel sent a message to him. And what the Bible says is, when he saw what she said, how do you see what somebody said? Was it written? No. He saw <laughs> her words. Jesus said, the words that I speak to you are spirit yeah, yeah. and they're light. They're beings. Can you see words? Yes, you can see words. Can you? Can I see words? Yes, I can see words. <laughs> you see words too. You just don't know you've seen them. Yeah. So you see the piece that you see. <laughs> you guys, you guys should. Um, there's this thing called synesthesia, right? And what what it is is like this: you would say certain things, and you would feel the words. If, if I ever, if, if, if someone ever, as your mom ever yelled at you and you felt <laughs> her anger, yeah. that's true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How did you feel her anger? Her face. It's not just her face, but 
her both her face, her words, her gestures, all these things are frequencies that you are perceiving. Perceiving. from seeing though. Feel. Feel. Makes sense. Okay. Seeing. Yeah. Does not. Okay. This I, 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 I totally agree. It does not. But it doesn't change the fact that it <laughs> is. <laughs> no, what I'm, what I'm trying to say, guys, is this. Listen, um, if, 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 you, if, if God opens your eyes to see angels right now, right? It's, you know, point, point of fact is, how is it that I can see an angel right now and you're not seeing the angel? Because you've not learned how to see as a spirit being, okay? But why am I, well, how did I get into this stuff? I just dug a hole myself. Yeah, you didn't say a little thought how it doesn't look like we're talking about. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, thank you. Let me just get back to that. Next week when we talk about training the senses, you know, some of this stuff will make more sense. But long story short, this devil came and oppressed me in my dream, in my sleep, and it caused me to, 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 have this anyway? He, it oppressed me. Had it had uh, uh, authority over me while I was asleep. Okay. Now, why did that kind of stuff happen? Why is it that a devil was able to oppress me in my sleep? Well, because of something called fear. Are you guys with me? Yes. Okay. There are people, Christians, who when they go to sleep, they have sexual intercourse with people in their sleep. Are you guys hearing me? Yeah. Well, that stuff is not just normal. That that is not normal. It's not just a dream. It is real, by the way. Sometimes. Huh. Is that a sin? No, I didn't say it's a sin, but I'm saying it's real. Let me stop. <clears throat> Show them. Get that on track. All right. So, long story short, long story short is this: fear attracts oppression. Are you hearing me? You probably want to stand up so you don't sleep because I will pour some water on you. I'm, I'm serious. I know. I can tell you every single thing you say all the time. I'm taking my extra credit back. I'm listening. All right. All right. So just hear me, guys. So let, let's move. Let's move. All right. So what, what needs to happen here is this we get this thing down pat. Amen. All right. So. Walk to walk in the spirit is to walk in love. Now remember, everything has to flow from this place, right? Right, guys. Come on now. Right. Everything has to flow from this place. So if with this being the case, I need to understand this whole deal. Let's let's look at uh um where is it? Galatians chapter five. Let's go back to Galatians. Please remind me not to go off course again. Galatians chapter 5. It says this, But if you are led by the Spirit, in verse 18, you are not on the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. So you have these things called the works of the flesh. Now, remember what, what I said, uh, I think two classes or three classes ago, about uh, sin. Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the works of the flesh. The reason why people sin is because they're not established in righteousness. Do you guys remember? Yeah. yeah so, so if you're walking in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, look at look at uh, verse 22 in Galatians 5. It says, But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. That's what my translation says. But in the Greek, the word is actually faith. Faithfulness? No, faith. Perfection. Faith, yes. <laughs> so the gift, the fruit of the spirit here is love, joy, peace, and all of that good stuff. Well, here it says faith. So faith is actually a fruit of the spirit. So faithfulness is not faithfulness. Okay, stay with me now. Think about this. He who fears has not been made perfect in love. In love. What does love do? It casts out fear. Okay, so if love casts out fear, what does it do? It gives you faith. It, it gives you boldness, right? You remember First John four eighteen uh, seventeen. Uh, love has been perfected in us, and this that on the day of both of judgment we may have boldness. First John four seventeen. 
Boldness, love produces boldness. It's this, that when you know that God loves you, it makes you bold. Yeah. Imagine you, you, you go and bully some kids, right? And have them bully some kids, or let's put it this way. So this kid is coming to bully you. Now, your dad comes into the scene, and your dad is, er, <laughs> all right? Now, when you see your dad, and you run to your dad, you know that your dad loves you, and part of the package that comes with his love for you is protection. Would you be scared? Yeah. What would your dad be with you at, at that moment do to you? He'll make you bold. You'll be so confident about not getting beat by this dude. I'm True or false? I'm sure. You have a bad example? Yeah. You want to teach my class? Yeah. Huh? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Come give me an example. Yeah. I don't want to say no. It's chill. All so right. It's like, well, that's like, like a Speak loud, like president. It's like, if you're, it's like if you're in high school uh -huh. and a bad story likes you. I mean, wow. what? <laughs> <laughs> It's like, it's like, it gives you boldness. It's like, terrible. You know what I'm saying, right? You know what I'm saying, right? It gives you boldness. It boosts your self-esteem. Exactly. The finest girl on the block. But that's not boldness. I like it. Okay, so for those of you who are watching, what he's saying here is that if if the if the, the the cutest girl on the block <laughs> why yeah. you know that you would be bold. Okay, thank you. Better than compared to anything. But understanding. I understand. But what I'm what do you think? Anyway. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So what we're I mean yeah. So God loves you. Okay. You guys with me? God loves you. When this becomes a reality to you, where it's not just words, what it would do is it would wipe out all fear in your life. Okay? Now, this is something that has to happen on a daily basis. Are you with me? Yeah. If the love of God is real to you today, you would not have any fear. If you're fearful and you say, I know that God loves me, you're lying to me and you're deceived. That's the truth. Perfect love casts out all fear. Is it some? All fear. Yes. Question. Question slash comment. You know, I think that what Are you about to challenge me? Not at all. Oh, yeah, I'm serious. <laughs> what what um I guess has messed me up in the past is yeah. like I know God loves me, right? Yeah. And if I'm in the face of something like, let's say, I don't know, I need to feel protected in a situation. I'm like, oh, God, protect me or yeah. keep me. Or if I know I, oh, perfect example, let's say I cheated on a test, right? Yeah. And I'm like, oh, my God, you know, I'm sorry. God, please don't let these people, like, catch me. Don't let them kick me out of school. But uh -huh. I also realized that because I entertained this sin, well, now I opened up a door, right? Or to be oppressed, kind of. So it's like that fear piece you were talking about. Mm -hmm. So I guess, how does that work? Like, you can know God loves you, but then I think that sometimes what messes me up or brings that fear back is if I fall. Yeah. And it kind of feels like, well, even though God loves me, He hates sin, you yeah. know? And light has nothing to do with darkness. So to me, sometimes my mind, I'm like, in this moment, God can do something, but he will not because, okay. you get what I'm saying? Yeah. So, remember we dealt with three different things. One of the things we dealt with regards to being established in righteousness is one, being established in righteousness with regards to your relationship with God. Remember that? Mm -hmm. That you're not trying to earn anything right. from God. You're not trying to earn acceptance with God. You guys remember that? Yeah. And so whatever you do, whether it's prayer, fasting, whatever it is, you're not doing it out of obligation because you feel obligated to do it, that if you don't do it, you would get punished. Because if you feel obligated to do it, then you would be doing it out of fear. You guys remember? Mm -hmm. Okay. The second thing we talked about was 
being established in righteousness with regards to your relationship with people. Right? And is that you're not trying to earn people's acceptance. You remember that? Mm -hmm. And then we talk about being established in righteousness with regards to your relationship with you, yourself. And it's that you're, 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 you choose to accept yourself in spite of you. That's a hard one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is the hardest one of all. Okay, so think about this with regards to people. Why would you, question, why would you cheat on a test? Because you want to pass. You want to pass and you don't want to fail. fail. So if you don't do what is right, what has to happen? Failure. Failure. So in the school system, is the righteousness a free gift? No. No. So if it's not a free gift, it means that there is a price right. for righteousness. Are you seeing what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. So in that situation, what moves you to, fear, to, to cheat in that kind of situation is the fear of people. Fear of failure is not and the fear of failure, the fear of your teacher failing, and yeah. But so let's just say the fear of else and anger. Okay. <laughs> the fear of failure. All right. The fear of failure will make you do things that you that are outside of your character. Okay. So how does this whole deal, the whole whole thing, translate with your relationship with God? The fact that you cheated in this arena doesn't change. How righteousness operates here. Okay. I'm righteous with God irrespective of what I do here or what I don't do, or what I do here or what I don't do. What makes me righteous here is what Jesus did and the fact that I'm exercising faith in Christ and his finished work. Right? So now, you can't, yeah, exactly, that's what I'm getting to. You, you don't take the righteousness, the, the, the free gift of righteousness. For granted, you don't take the grace of God for granted. So the point that I keep coming back to is this, that grace does not empower us to sin. Really, what grace does is it pushes you away from sin. You see, what love does is love pushes, love pushes you away from sin because in, 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 in unconditional love, you don't have to do anything to be loved. You're loved as you are. Right? Yeah. All right. Yes, Shem. Yeah. Are you guys actually here? Yeah. 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 <laughs> so this love is without condition. Mm -hmm. And because this love is without condition, I don't have to do anything to try to earn the love. It's a free gift. Now, because I don't have to do anything to earn the love, then there's no need for me to be fearful. All right? Yeah. And there is no sense of obligation. Are you guys hearing me? Yeah. And if there's no sense of obligation and there's no fear, then I'm not going to actually do anything wrong. I'm not. What pushes us to do wrong or sin really is fear. That's the truth. The fear of punishment. I I'm scared. Why, yeah, you remember the example I gave? Why do you lie to your mom? Fear. Right? So if I'm not scared of punishment, then why would I do anything wrong? The only thing that motivates sin in the first place is fear. Period. I don't care what sin is, even fornication. Now the question is, okay, why would fear of what would push me to fornicate? I'm not sure. But there's fear somewhere there. Because if there is no fear, you will be walking in the spirit. If you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And to walk in the spirit is to walk in love, right? What's the, what's the verse that says you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh? Galatians 5. We've read it like twice already. Just making sure. Hmm. <laughs> so if I'm walking in the spirit, I will not fulfill the lust of the flesh, right? Yeah. So let, let's draw this table. All right? Let's look at it this way. Right? This is walk in the spirit, no be that. All right? Here, there is no sin because you walk in the spirit. Sorry, no sin, right? But if you walk in the flesh, there is sin, true or false? If you walk in the spirit, you walk in the love, right? Right. If you walk in the love, there is no fear here. The reason you are walking in love, sorry, you're walking in love. There is no fear 
there's love and there's boldness, right? There's no obligation, but here you're walking in the flesh, there is fear, and fear, what fear does is it produces sin. So whenever there is sin, love is not present. Is it? Yeah. No. No, it doesn't? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I missed it. Oh boy. I'm so sorry. That's cool. No, I'm saying like so. I think that my natural mind is just like, okay, I'm trying to figure out how to deal with this aspect where if I do something wrong, right, yeah. and I know I've done something wrong, if right. I sin, mm-hmm. and I know that light has nothing to do with darkness. You understand what I'm saying? Right. So. In that situation where I sinned, I feel like I can't be bold oh, because it's like, I see well, I about. know that it's darkness, and I, like you know, it's just like that principle, like it's sin, so I know God is yeah. not involved. He doesn't like sin, right? Right. It's so it's like almost, what's the point of? Looking for him in that situation. Let's let's look at the scripture. Let's look at Hebrews. Okay. All right. I think this will help. I don't want me to talk about what I really want to talk about today. It's cool. Right. That's yeah. cool. I'm never talking about this anyway. Hebrews chapter. Uh, chapter what? Hold on, please. Yeah, Hebrews chapter four. Listen carefully, guys. Listen to this. Verse 16. Let us therefore, you got to read the context, but anyway, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Now, when I say that I need mercy, it means that I've done something wrong, right? Okay. Now, I, I, I did some. Hey, look at this. Let's clean this up. I love pictures, all right? That's why I keep writing everything. All right, so here we go. You guys there? Yes, pay attention. I did something wrong. Okay, right, let's just say I said it, all right? Now, God says what you need is called mercy, right? You need to be pardoned for what you did wrong, right? Now, where is mercy? On the other side. On the other side. The place called the throne of grace. Now, he who needs mercy is or has sin. He's in the wrong. He's guilty of something. Right? Alright? So, you're guilty of something and you need mercy. Now, the normal inclination or the normal thing to do is to be fearful. Like, hello. See, the throne of grace. Who sits on the throne? Jesus. God, God right? Alright, so God is on the throne. But now, this is the only place you can get mercy. True or false? True. Yeah. So, if you want this mercy, you got to go there. Right? Mm-hmm. But now, you're guilty. And because you're guilty, you're fearful of going here. Right? Mm-hmm. But look at what the Bible says. Let us then when I come out. Lonely, but Whoa, yes. it also says that, um, <laughs> what's the scripture that talks about how there's no more grace left like for you continue. Oh, boy. What? <laughs> you see you know what I'm, hope for me here. I'm not trying to dig a hole for you, but this is real. You know, this is what I think about. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's just like, well, I did it once, I knew it was wrong, and I did it again multiple times. Right. So this, the Bible says there's no more grace left for that. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's, what is the okay, you need, how, What I would say, though, is you need to read that passage of Scripture carefully. Hebrews chapter 6, I believe. Mm-hmm. That's okay. Hebrews chapter 6. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Oh. No, that's Hebrews 6, where it talks about the first principles. But it says, let me just read it. It says, uh, for if it is for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and haven't tasted the heavenly gift, right? And haven't become partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, 
to renew them away again to repentance. Is that the, the one you're talking about? No. no. I think she's talking about 10, 26. 10, 26. I know she's talking Let's look at it. Hebrews 10, 26. For we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Mm -hmm. That's different. There no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Look at, it's, it's awesome. Read the whole chapter. Actually, I, 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 would, I would say read the whole book of Hebrews because it's a whole context. The point is, Jesus Christ died on the cross once and for all. Is he going to come back and down the cross again? No, the sacrifice has been paid once and for all. The sacrifice he paid, he paid it even before he came into the world. But he paid it for your past, present, and future sins before you came in. So there's no longer a sacrifice for sins. It's already been paid. There's just the one. Universe. Yeah, so that's not a condemning person. Right. No. Oh, so I just misunderstood. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So All right. look at this. Now, what the Bible says to do is to come boldly to this arena, right? So you come boldly. The only way you're going to come here and receive mercy is, is if you come boldly. Look at, look at this, guys. The only way you're going to come to this place to receive mercy is if you come boldly. Forget mercy without boldness. It's not going to happen. The requirement for coming here is boldness. But how can you be bold when you're guilty? The reason you can be bold because when you're guilty is because of faith in Christ. Jesus Christ has become the gateway towards this arena. It is this that when you mess up, all right, you can still come boldly. Your boldness is not with regards to who you are. Stay with me. It's all about who he is. He makes me bold. Mm -hmm. I'm not good enough to be bold by my own strength. What makes me bold enough to come before the Father is what Jesus did. Yes. Mm -hmm. What? That faith is produced by love. Right? That faith is produced by love. When you understand how much God loves you and the price that he paid for you, then you have boldness. You guys with me? Mm -hmm. Alright, so let's, let's deal with the stuff here. Let's Let's talk a little bit more about faith, all right? How about that? Mm -hmm. All right. Listen right. to this. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2 says, uh, this, let me start with verse 1. Therefore, since the promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any one of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us, and as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them. Listen, guys, it did not profit them not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he said, you know. So, what needs to happen is what we're hearing, we mix it with faith. faith. Stay with me, guys. This is, this, our person, well, everything is important. But this is very important. You have to mix the word with faith. Now, it makes it look as though I have to like, oh, here comes here comes the word. Come here, word. Whoa! Look, you guys have been missing stuff. You you see, I'm I'm a very expressive person, so you have to look at me okay. to get what I'm saying. All right, all right. Big mm -hmm. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so it's like this. Bring this you, you, you sat in my class. No, I was listening. Like, you know, you know, you know, you know, I'm gonna tell you every single word you say. Yeah, right. Anyway, so he goes. He goes. The word. The word is coming. The word is coming. I'm like, whoa! And I catch it right, and then I make some faith, right, so they can profit me, all right. The word they heard, they didn't mix it with faith. See, the, the point I'm bringing from this picture is this. We, we often think of faith as this really hard thing or commodity to get. 
Uh, all right? It's like faith, like faith for a billion dollars. Well, y'all saw, you ain't saw believe for that yet. But faith for, to, to get your, your headache healed or whatever. You know, like faith, man. I need faith, man. I need to get in the word, man, so I can do my faith, man. You know, like my faith is dwindling, son. But the way that we learn about faith makes faith look like this hard thing to, to attain. But I want to make it easy for you guys. Can I try? Try. Because the point here is Galatians 5 makes faith look, which it is really. It says faith is a fruit of the Spirit. So all you need is a tree with branches, and it will produce fruit. How hard is it for a tree to produce fruit? It's not hard at all. It takes a long time for it to produce fruit. It's natural for it to produce fruit. It's natural for it to produce fruit. You guys are saying the right answers. And that's what I want to get to with this stuff. I want you to think of faith as a fruit. If you can think of faith as a fruit, I think it changes a whole lot. All right, so let's let's look at some examples. Let's go to Matthew chapter 8. All right, so for now, I'm not going to take any questions just because I want to move really fast. I have about 30 minutes more. Matthew chapter 8, because I want to give you guys a test. Matthew chapter 8. If I don't, you, you guys... You just send a test in the email. Yeah, you take a test. Matthew chapter 8. Look at verse... Verse uh, 5. It says, Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, the centurion came to him pleading with them, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home, paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word, and my servant will be healed. For I also, for I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. No. Look at this. It says, when Jesus heard what he said, when Jesus heard it, what? So, Jesus heard something, and after he heard what he said, he's like, wow. I've not found such great faith, not even in Israel. How did Jesus know that he had great faith? Because he heard it. He heard what he said. And what he said was proof of the fact that he had great faith. Yeah, stay with me. Just, <laughs> no, this is not about frequencies, actually. Just stay with me. It's, this is actually really, really simple. Just stay with me. Okay? So Jesus heard what this guy said, and Jesus was able to say, because of what you said, you have great faith. So great faith in this context can be defined based off of what this dude said. True or false? Well, I'm true. So all we need to do is really understand what he said and why what he said not produce great faith was a sign or proof of great faith or was evidence of great faith. True or false? True. All right, let's look at another one. Matthew chapter 15, verse 28. We're going to come to this. No, I'm, we're going to do this today. Matthew chapter 15, verse 28. I'm sure many of you, some of you, if not many of you, including those of you watching, have probably heard teachings on great faith. But uh, uh, anyway, whatever. Matthew chapter 15, verse 28. Actually, I'm not going to start from 28. Let's start from uh, 21. Jesus, then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan, Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy upon me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered her not a word, and his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, 
It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it into throw it to the little dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be unto you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Now, here's another scenario of great faith. Are you hearing me? Now, Jesus heard what she said. The Bible says, Then Jesus, what is it? Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. So there's something about what these people are saying that uh, shows us that they had great faith. What is it? Well, first things first. Let's look at the, the, the word great, all right? For the first scenario, we have this, uh, the story of the centurion, right? The word great in Greek is the word, let me just write it out. I'm not too sure how to pronounce this, yeah, but. Oh boy, I'm running out of time. C O T O S O U T O S. All right, this is the word great. All right, and it means now you have two different. Uh, you have two. The words can be used in two different ways. All right, the first way it can be used is one with regards to quantity. All right. The second is with regards to time. That is how long. Are you hearing me? Mm -hmm. All right. Now the second scenario with the with the woman, right? The Shunammite woman. Matthew chapter fifteen, verse twenty-eight. The word faith. I mean, great. Right here. This is one. The second one is the word. Man, are you hearing me? Yeah. All right. Now this word can be used in different ways. One of it. Let me just read what the concordance says. It says, "Of external form or sensible appearance of things." Okay, the appearance of things. Mm -hmm. Now, one way it can be used is of age, life, and elder. Are you hearing me? Yeah. Okay. So. Look at both of them and think. Let's look at a situation here. Let's go to Matthew chapter uh, the, the 14. We're going to come back to these ones. Matthew chapter 14. Look at verse 22. Okay? I'm going to read really quick. Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side when, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, from the, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. So he sends them out, get on the sea, he goes to pray. Now at this point in time, of the middle, in the middle of the night, the boat is being tossed on the floor, the wind was raining, blah, 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 blah. And Jesus goes to them, walking on the floor. All right. Verse 26, and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit, or a ghost. And this is the same word. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked in the water to go to Jesus. Did he walk in the water? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Verse 30, but when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O ye of little faith, why did you doubt? So here's the word little, right? Y'all here? Yes, sir. Are you disturbing my class? No. No? He was in the rest of All right. Oh, ye of little faith. So we have great here, and then on one end you have little. What word? This? 
You missed that part when you went out. Go back and listen to it. Here's what it means. But it's the word great. All right? Great. The word great is in the two in the two stories we listen to. Are you hearing? The two stories we read about, the one of the woman, the word great is the word mega. The one of the, the men, the word great is the word Jesusus. All right? And you, it can be you can be used to mean quantity or it can be used to mean time or how long. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this whole idea of quantity away from the scene. All right? And we're going to go with that which has to do with time. Now, what did the centurion soldier say? He says, you know, I'm a man of the authority. And so, long story short, this guy was a high-ranking officer. Yeah. Right? A centurion is a high-ranking officer. Yeah. And he has people under him. Mm -hmm. All right? Now, do you just... Do you join the army and just become a high-ranking officer? No. Of course not. You go through stages. Yeah, I mean, maybe it took him 20 years to get there. I personally think it took him 20 years, but whatever. Anyway, let's say it took him 20 years to get there. Now, in 20 years, do you think that he would at least have understood the protocol of the military? Yeah, yeah he understands how things work. How, I mean, of course, he started somewhere. And then not only did he start somewhere, but now he has people under him who he sends on errands. Come, they come. Go, they go. Right? right. And he's like, he told, he turns to Jesus and he's like, you understand what I apparently understand. Or let me put it this way. I understand what you understand. And so you don't need to come all the way to my house to get my servant healed. You can just speak the word from where you are at, and my servant will be healed. Right? So apparently this guy must understand that Jesus has some servants, yeah. angels. Maybe he didn't know too much about angels, but at least he understood the whole concept of authority. Right? Mm -hmm. Now think about this. He didn't understand, this centurion soldier didn't understand that just like that. It took him a while to understand this deal. Right? Would you agree? Yeah. As a high-ranking officer, Understanding the processes, the protocols, and the engagements, and all that kind of stuff of the military system, you have to have gone through that process a number of times, right? This is what I'm saying today is very important for what we're going to be talking about. So, really pay attention, all right? So, he understood this thing over time, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, sure. 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 So, if he understood this over time, and after he gave his speech, Jesus is like, oh, you have great faith. And the word great has to do with time. What are we talking about here? His faith withstood the test of time. This wasn't faith that he... Came that that he received a minute ago. This is something he had been practicing for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Okay, look at look at the situation of the woman. All right, That's, we're, we're going to connect this. Hold on. Look at that at the situation of the woman. The woman comes to Jesus. Right now, to start with, she's not supposed to come to Jesus. As far as history is concerned, or as far as like the timeline of things or whatever is concerned, Jesus at that point in time did not come for anybody but the house of Israel. So, there are a group of people that Jesus came for. These were the people that had free access to him. Every person else was exempt from the blessings of God at that point in time. Are you with me? Now, we as Gentiles can have access to that now because God has broken the wall that separated us from those Jews back then, the Hebrews. All right? So now, before that, nobody except the Hebrews or the Jews, whatever, had access to Jesus. Jesus would not have answered them. But this woman comes to Jesus, and she calls him son of David, as though she's a Hebrew, because the Hebrews understood that he was the son of David, right? But she, she, gives, she calls him by a title or a name that 
is known amongst the Hebrews. It's like BCF people, right? BCF people, we know what we call Uncle George. You're like Uncle George, right? And then this person comes from nowhere and he's like, yeah, Uncle George. And he's trying to act like he's a BCF member, whereas he's not. But he's trying to speak our vernacular to disguise, disguise himself as a BCF member. Is Does that make sense? All right, so anyway, long story short, she comes acting like she's a Hebrew. And she's like, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, at that point in time, like I said, she's not supposed to get anything from Jesus. But she came to start with believing that she was going to receive, right? Think about it. This woman is at this point. <laughs> this woman, please pay attention, is at this point really desperate. Okay? If you ask me questions, I'm not going to answer you because you're not listening. At this point in time, this woman is desperate. Now, she comes to Jesus believing that what she came for, she's going to receive, right? Mm -hmm. But now, she knows that what she's doing is risky because she's not supposed to come to Jesus in the first place. She's not even supposed to be under the same roof as he is. All right. So now she comes, and she's like, have mercy on me. And he's like, no, I can't have mercy on you because what I have is not for a dog. She called her a dog. But this woman is like, even dogs eat the crumbs that fall from a master's table. You could call her a dog. Yes. Now, listen to this. Just stay with me, okay? Whether it's me or not. <laughs> but what I'm trying to bring up here is this. In the Bible, it says this, that our faith will be tested by fire. Are you hearing me? Yeah. That's your assignment. Go look for that scripture, because I don't remember. Anyway, it says that your faith will be tried by fire. Are you hearing me? Mm -hmm. Your faith will be tried by fire. What that means is your faith is going to have to stand the test of time. Peter, Jesus, is that you? Yes, it's me. Well, if it's you, bid me to come to you in water. Now, before then, do you think Peter had faith to walk on water? No, he didn't. When did he receive the faith to walk on water? When Jesus said, come. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So Jesus is like, come. And he hears the word, come. He's like, ooh, faith comes in, I'm going to do it. Right? And now he steps on water, and he starts to walk on water. But then here comes the wind, and he looks at the wind, like, oh, I'm going to die. And he starts to sink. Yeah? And he cries out for help. Jesus comes and pulls him up. And he's like, oh, ye of little faith, why did you doubt? Are you here with me? Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, think about this. Did he have faith to walk on water? Mm -hmm. At first. At first? Yes, I did. Okay, now think about it. If, if faith is about quantity or size, why is it that after he started to sink, Jesus is like, oh, ye of little faith? If little faith, I mean, he, did he have faith? Yes. Yeah. But was his faith little? Yeah. Was it little? Yeah. Okay, stay with me now. Look, look at this. One, like, one moment he's walking on water. The next moment he's sinking. And when he's sinking, Jesus is like, your faith is little. Well, we look at that and we think that he had little faith all along. And Or maybe he didn't have little faith all along. Maybe... As soon as all of that stuff started to happen, hold on, just stay with me. As soon as all of that stuff started to happen, his faith started to leak out of the balloon. That is... That's the picture we usually get, but that is not true. Okay? It's this. Little faith has nothing to do... Okay, sorry. Let me, let me say that. <clears throat> he has little faith at the time that he's sinking. The reason he has little faith, let me just go straight to the point, is because his faith that he had was not given time enough to develop. Now, when I say develop, I'm talking about age. I'm talking about time. I'm talking about this, that one minute what we do is we hear a good word, and we're like, I can do it. There is faith burned inside of us. But then stuff begins to happen in your life that makes you to doubt. And 
It's like a baby, right? A baby is born, and the baby is not given time to grow up, to mature. You don't give the baby time enough to become an elder, an older person. But rather than that, you abort the baby before time. You kill the baby before time. That's what faith is. Faith is like a baby. And the baby has to be treasured. The, the only way the baby is going to come into maturity is if the baby is treasured. How long did Peter's faith last? Maybe five seconds. I don't know, however long it is that he walked on water. The minute he began to sink, his faith became little. So here's the point. It wasn't a matter of quantity or size or mass or weight. It was really a matter of age. Faith is born. Boom. Faith to accomplish a test. And now you're able to accomplish that test. But then all of a sudden, stuff begins to happen in your life. And then your faith transitions from being great, or I'm sorry, it trans transitions from being faith to little faith. If Peter did not doubt, his faith would have developed and he, it would have become great faith. Reason because he did not waver. He was focused. Now, why am I saying all of this stuff? Okay, so before I get there, what is great faith? What is little faith? What is no faith? The no that see great faith is faith that has withstood the test of time. Your faith will be tested by fire. When the woman came to Jesus and asked for mercy, and Jesus said, you know, you're a dog and all that kind of stuff, what was he doing? He was testing her faith by fire. Like, if you really have faith, let's see what happens when discouragement comes. What Jesus said was enough to make her discouraged, true or false. But she refused to be refused. Yeah. She was like, I'm getting my stuff today, bro. <laughs> I'm getting up, bro. And when her faith was tried by fire, she she had a good combat. Let's just put it there. She had a good combat. And because she had a good combat, Jesus was like, okay, yeah. your, faith, <laughs> your faith has been tested by fire. It has withstood the test of time. And now you can receive. Mm. Mm. It's like a bridge. Mm. Listen, the reason this is important is because we're going to learn about training your spirit. Yeah? And what would happen is you're going to want immediate results. I got tried it for a week and it didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that, I hear, listen, I hear this all the time. You know, it, it, it's just like I, I was listening to this preacher. She was preaching about uh, some of the issues she was going through in the past. And then she was like, you know, they told us to write stuff on paper. I tried it. I wrote it on paper and I tore it in the name of Jesus and nothing happened. <laughs> I was like, listen, listen to me. You, you tried a process that works. Yeah, it's like this. It's like let's use an example. It's like fornication, or let's say when, uh, you have like a soul tie to a guy, and you're so he's like, okay, wow. you need to break this thing with this guy. So write his name on a piece of paper in the name of Jesus, tear it into pieces. You know, and she's like, I tried this stuff and it didn't work. Listen to me, guys. I think it's it's not that she tried it and it didn't work. The process tried her and she didn't work. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I just wanted to sound deep. <laughs> but for real though, I'm, I'm telling you guys, you guys are gonna are, are gonna engage in faith, yeah. And when it doesn't work, when you want it to work, you be like, it didn't work. It doesn't work. No, please shut up. It does work. The truth is, it does work. But you didn't add to your faith patience. Hebrews chapter six. <laughs> Let's go to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. Listen to verse. Listen to me. Verse 11. And the desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate, listen, 
those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. How are you going to inherit any promise? Faith and patience. How are you going to train your senses? Faith and patience. That means if, if patience is there, it means that it, it's not guaranteed to happen immediately. Are you guys hearing me? When I started to train my eyes to see in the spirit, it didn't happen immediately. You guys want to see in the spirit, right? No, no, seriously. Yeah. Okay, you guys want to be able to discern the voice of God, right? Like God's speaking to me, and I know it's His voice. And you guys want to be able to feel the presence of God, right? Right. You guys want to smell. Right? Okay. All right. <laughs> so the point I'm bringing is this: this stuff happens over time. What allows it to happen to start with is faith. The fact that you believe it will happen. Okay. Now. Your faith will be tested. It means that you would believe, but there would be a test to prove your faith. And it's to see whether or not you are going to stand in the day of adversity. Because whatever you get easy, for real, you're not going to value. Somebody, I, I once heard somebody say that the, the difficulty of attainment determines the value of an object. Yeah. Now I'm not saying that you have to earn anything. Please don't misunderstand me. Yeah, don't misunderstand me. I'm saying that God wants us to come into a place of maturity. Hmm. I'm looking for an example to give. Let's see. Uh, One of the things I started to do, you know, this scripture that says, Come therefore before the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and find grace to help us. You've read that, remember? Okay, now, I understood that the throne of grace is not on earth. It's in heaven. I mean, where is the throne? Heaven. Heaven, right? So, I want to receive mercy. Now, I learned this. I have not so long ago. That the kingdom of God is as close to me as the ear that I breathe. In you know, God is everywhere. Period. All right. So heaven is as is as close to me as the air that I breathe. The kingdom of God is at hand. That's my understanding of it, and that's how Hebrews understand this stuff. Anyway, long story short, I understand I can literally step, take one step into the realm of God's kingdom. Heaven is not like million years away. Heaven is as close to me as the air that I breathe. So that means, listen, listen to me, guys. Listen. Just Look up here. Look up here. Heaven. Listen. Heaven is as close to me as the air that I breathe. I can take one step into heaven. Are you listening to me? Now, this is far fetched from what you taught in church. I know. All right? Because I know the church you got to go to. So, what the point I'm bringing is heaven is not, it's, it's this close. I can take one step before the throne of, and I would land in the throne that place. Now, I understood this, and I began to train my senses. Now, we're going to talk about training your senses next week. What I started to do was this. I understood that it, it's just one thing on I just need to step into it. It's all about becoming, yeah, I know. It's the prime you knew this. It's yeah. Anyway, whatever. I understood that it's all about faith. Are you with me? Yeah. But nothing shall be impossible to those who believe. All right. So every day I would practice stepping in. Y'all talk about stepping in. This is what stepping in really is. Not the slang that y'all talk about. I'm trying to go in. No, this is how to go in. All right. So by faith, your word father says that I can come boldly before the throne of Great. So I'll tell you mercy and find yourself in time with me. I believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So by faith, I would imagine a door in front of me, right? And I would step in through that door into this arena. Now, I did this for weeks. Nothing happened. Okay? Every day. My faith, Father, in the name of Jesus, I take a 
Oh, step into the atmosphere of the of your presence in Jesus' name. Mm, hallelujah. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just pray in this atmosphere, right? And then by faith, Father, I take a step back into the atmosphere of the realm of the earth, and I escort back the, you know, all of that stuff. Days, nothing was happening. Now, that is enough to get you discouraged. Like, nah, this stuff doesn't work. I didn't read my Bible right. <laughs> but I know what I read. I, I read my Bible right. So one day, I'm about to step, go in, and guess who comes in front of me? Yeah, Jesus. Jesus is like, uh, hello, henceforth. If you're trying to come here, you have to go through me. John chapter 10. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to my Father except through me. So I have to. So from that day forward, that it meant that I had to walk through Jesus to get into that arena. What does that mean? Did you walk? It means that I walk through His body. Literally. Your yes. Body. Like spiritually or? <laughs> Literally. <laughs> what does that mean? So. Imagine yourself standing in front of me and I walk through your body into another place. All right, so, Father, by faith, thank you, Lord Jesus, because you're here. He's always here. So, Jesus, uh, take a step through you, boom, and I'm there. Yeah? And I did this, I would walk through him and I would still be in my room. <laughs> yeah? But I was not in my room. The, the fact that I was still in my room and thought that I was still in my room was just that my body or my physical senses had not caught up with what was really happening. So, one day, I'm off, I'm, I got eight more minutes. One day, I do this stuff. Father by faith, I come boldly before the, this is like weeks later, I come boldly before your throne of grace and I come walking through my Lord Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, the life, and I step into the atmosphere of the realm of the earth, the, uh, into the I step into the atmosphere of the realm of your presence before the throne of grace, and I stand right now on the sea of glass. <laughs> yeah, good question. Hold on. And I stand on the sea of glass, and Father, by faith, I trade my heart right now on the sea of glass. It's, it's a trading for But before the throne of God, there's a sea of glass. It's in your Bible, right? Book of Revelation. Right? So I trade. It's a place where you go and trade. So I trade my heart. I trade my time, for your presence. I just trade. I trade something that I have for something that I desire, that belongs to me, and I just trade right now by faith in Jesus' name. And then, look, here's where this stuff I, I, I did for days, weeks, nothing happened, right? In one moment, I do it, and guess what I saw? I saw a bunch of people doing what I was doing. So I was not in my room anymore. I was there, but then I was not there. <laughs> I'm like, this is interesting. What are these guys doing there? See, when you think you're the only person doing stuff, you're not the only person. Just like Elijah thought he was the only prophet alive. You're not the only person. There's a ton of people doing stuff. They're just not talking about it. Mm. Mm. I practice this stuff with the throne of grace. I practice this stuff with the Word of God. I'll give you another example. Hold on, Gucci. You know, the Bible talks about in the book of uh, John chapter, I think it's, well, it's in the Bible, where it says that these, Jesus walked with these two people after he was raised from the dead. After he was raised from the dead, he walked with them, he talked with them, he went to the house on the, you know, the, on the road to Emmaus. So they got to Emmaus, he stayed in their house. The Bible says he, they gave him bread, he took the bread, he broke it, and then he gave it to them, and then their eyes were open, and they saw him, and then he disappeared. But before that, they didn't know it was Jesus speaking to them. You guys know that story? Mm -hmm. Jesus walked with two people, and they didn't know it was Jesus, but then their hearts were burning while he was talking to them. And I was like, and then they went out, they, they traveled back, and they, they went to the apostles. They were like, man, we just walked with Jesus, and, you know, uh, he was known to us, known, senses, he was known to us in the breaking of bread. So that was their testimony, that Jesus was known to them in the breaking of bread. So I decided, hmm, I want that to be my testimony. I want Jesus to be known to me in the breaking of bread. I want to see Jesus in the breaking of bread. So every day for a whole week, not breaking of bread is something that, that, that I, you know, was a day-to-day -day thing, all right? But for just one week, I decided I was not going to eat anything else but Bread. I was just going to break bread 
like Jesus broke bread and all of that good stuff. So every day I would step, I would go in into the presence of God, right? And I would give Jesus, I would imagine myself giving Jesus bread and Jesus breaking it. And I receive it back from him and I eat it. I give him wine, Kool-Aid, whatever. He blesses it. I receive it back from him. I drink it. Now, this is me being a baby. Unless you become like a baby, you would not see the kingdom of God. Yeah? So, but, yeah. All right. So, I did this for a whole week. Did I see Jesus? No. All right? But I decided I was just going to do just one week of fasting, and all I was going to eat was bread and wine for a whole week. Morning, afternoon, evening. That was my breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And then two days, listen, two days after this fast, guess who I saw? Jesus. That's right. His hair, wide as wool. He had a white garment. He had a blue sash. And he was standing in front or beside in the middle of, sorry, in the middle of two pillars. He had clothes on? Yes, he had clothes on. No, I'm listening. Are you paying attention? He like white garment. Anyway, listen. The point I'm bringing out from this is this. Listen. Listen, guys. I'm going to give you guys some keys. It's here in your Bible. If you practice them, they will work. If you don't, they will not work. You have to have faith and patience. How does faith come? Faith comes when you know that he loves you. Love produces faith. Confidence, boldness, faith. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Ah. So, how hard is this faith issue? It's not hard. It's all about dwelling in the love of God. Abiding in the love of Christ. If you can abide there, everything else would flow. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Remember that? Righteousness. Walking in the spirit, walking in love. And his righteousness and everything will be added to you. Faith is a fruit. Of love. Yes, good question. Uh, um, I had a question first. Last year she did. Okay, hold on. Yes. Uh, how is um for faith like? Does it have to be like um? I have two more minutes. All right. Well, like, cause you always say like you use your imagination and everything. Yeah. Because you always have to imagine like um, when you have a faith. Does that, does that make sense? Okay, the word imagination is the word meditation. You look up the word meditation in your Bible, and you will see the word, I mean, in Greek, you will see the word imagination. People think that imagination is bad, mm -hmm. but God gave you your imagination for a reason. The truth is you see in your imagination. Close your eyes. Imagine a blue horse. Did you see it? Yes. <laughs> How did you see it with your eyes closed? <laughs> because you see in here. Do you dream? Listen, do you dream? Yeah. yeah. With your eyes open? No. no. With your eyes closed. How are you able to see pictures with your eyes closed? Because you don't see in your eyes. You see in your head. Oh. In a place called the screen of your imagination. But can't you daydream with your eyes open? Yes, you can. Okay, that's not, that's not why, like, when you imagine stuff, like, it's sick, because, like, you're seeing it. You, know, you, you said what? Like, when God talks about, how, when God talks about, like, lust, and how that's adultery in your heart. Yeah, what you, what you imagine, what you imagine is different, though. Which, it, it's, it's a question of, are you actively imagining something that you're not supposed to be imagining? We're, we're going to talk about that more next week, but, yeah, what was your question? I said, okay, so when we stepped into the kingdom, we finally saw Jesus. Uh -huh. um, were you not expecting it? Like, was it something that's... At that point, I, I was about to go to sleep. And you so it was just a regular day, like, it was part of your routine to step into the kingdom. And yeah. you got that. Yeah, so, I mean, he even got to a point where Jesus would come to my room every day and we'll dance together. So God is directly going to catch you. We're going to dance, too. I'm still like, we're going to dance. What time are we dancing? I'm still like, we're going to dance. What's that wall? Oh, wall? Wall? Still wall? Yeah. Wall? He's a very good dancer. Wait, you got to dance with you. Wow. So I'm still asking hmm? questions. He did the wall. What's the wall? The wall. 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 The
Do you have to know like all those sea of glass things? Like do you do you have to know those things in order to pray the right prayer to answer? You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I see what you say. Because that's <laughs> now, what, what, what you need is this. You need something called an anchor. Okay. And here, here's, hear me out, guys. Are you here with me? Here's an example. The Garden of Eden. It's a place. You can go there. I've been to a garden in the realm of the Spirit. Not once, not twice. All right. Anyway, long story short, that is, I go there and I meet with Jesus. Are you guys here with me? Yeah. No. Going there, I can wait for G for whenever Jesus is in the movie, like, oh, come to my garden, and I find myself there. But then, Revelation 3, 20 tells me that one, at some point, he will come in and dine with me. At some point, I will go in and dine with him so I can actually go because it's his desire. He gives me permission to come boldly. So going to that place is something I can do out of desire. I have a desire to go and spend time with Jesus. I can go there. Now, what allows me, man, I'm getting, but anyway, just stay with me. It's like what allows, what, what empowers me to be able to go there is something called meditation. And it's that I'm meditating on the garden. I want to meet with Jesus in the garden. And because I'm meditating on, on this garden thing, I'm giving myself a picture of what a garden looks like so when I get there, I can actually recognize that I'm there. It's kind of tricky. But the, here's what I want you to take with you. Every one of you are seen in the spirit. You just don't know it. Okay. The reason you don't know it is because you've not trained your senses to see in the spirit. Something called your hippocampus in your head shreds the images that you're receiving from your spirit every day. The reason it's shredding those information is because it has no grid for it. So you have to give your hippocampus a grid for what it's receiving so it doesn't shred it. We'll talk about that next week. Right, let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Father, I thank you for the privilege to be able to share these things. Jesus, right? Can you remember what you said? Oh, yeah. Thank you.